Hello, everyone. Uh, today is Sunday. Today is August 25th, uh, the Thursday community call. Really excited to have uh, two folks, Daniel and Jakob from uh, Active Inference Lab to coming in to talk about lab and institute and sort of what they're thinking about. Or I don't know if I just uh, gave a little faux pas. Now the, inst the lab has been renamed the Institute and I was unaware of that until I just thought about it as I was talking. Um, but yeah, excited to get into that. Before we hand off the reins on presenting uh, and running with the call to, to Daniel and Jakob, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping and some general kind of announcements and things going on. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, we have a couple of guilds, uh, guild meetings coming up. Um, I don't know if Brian is on yet. Paul, do you want to quickly jump in and chat about those for a moment just so other folks can know? Yeah, absolutely. So most immediately uh, tomorrow, on Friday the 26th, uh, there is going to be the skill sprint on how we are basically configuring our source cred so that people can kind of come up with their own payout models. The other things kind of coming up along those lines uh, would be um, on September 1st, the onboarding boot camp is coming together. So brand new people to the organization uh, that would be an opportunity for us to kind of do some onboarding boot camp stuff with you. But we also are welcoming uh, and encouraging people who are longtime scurfers to join as well, because it's always good to kind of make those initial connections during onboarding processes. Uh, also on the 1st of September is the chat guild uh, meeting. And so the chat guild is basically uh, our community group or community guild of people who are interested in what is happening in chat and um, how it's configured so it can best um, satisfy the needs of our community so that people can find information, and interact with people and things like that. And that's how uh, we continue to get community input on the experiences that they're having. So those are the overviews and uh, Brian put some additional information in the chat for us. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul and Brian. I'm going to quickly just share screen and show because we've realized a few folks, especially who are newer to Discord, uh, yeah, excuse the infinite tunneling for a moment, um, but might not see where the events are. So just to let people know, because also to plug another thing right after this call, today's just a day of DSI for our community. Uh, so we, we have the Active Inference Institute uh, folks with Daniel and Yaka presenting now. Uh, and right after this, uh, we're going to do the follow up session to the coffee house chat. Uh, so I'll let uh, John jump in in a moment and, and mention that. But just to quickly say, if anyone is looking of like, hey, where are the events going on? And where do I go? If you click up there, you will see with the relevant information, including the coffee house chat uh, right after this, uh, which we'll be having. And if you just want to go to the live discussions uh, and you go to this live section here, it's the bottom one here in the live. And whenever you hop in there, it auto starts that conversation. Uh, so yeah, if you ever want to hop in live or just spontaneously start a bit of a conversation and see who's around to co-work with you virtually, always feel free to do that. Uh, but John, do you want to quickly jump in and, and mention the coffee house chats overall? Sure. Uh, this is the second running of sort of the beta tests of this thing where we're trying to get people to come in and talk about the research and posts and sort of events around SCURF. Uh, today we're joined by Martin and Zunk of Blockchain for Science, uh, which is a like kind of an early, maybe close to the beginning of DSI. It's a, a, they put together a group of uh, people talking about different blockchains and how they can help science way back in like 2015, 16. Uh, they hosted a conference around that time as well. So we'll talk about that. Uh, and sort of get their, their perspectives on how DSI has evolved over the years. But I want to remind everyone that these coffee house chats are meant to be a very inclusive discussion. It's not like a, we're going to ask them to present. We're going to ask like them to maybe kick off the discussion. But then hopefully uh, everyone will be feeling talkative and, and want to share their thoughts and experiences with DSI as it's grown over the years. And feel free to ask questions as well and really just kind of talk about stuff. It's, very, it's meant to be very informal. Uh, they take place every Thursdays uh, right after the community calls. So if you want to host one as well, you're welcome to. Just reach out to me. The only requirement is that it's somewhat related in some way to something that's posted on the SCURF forums. So there's a last week we did research on um, 
privacy on the blockchain and there's a lot of research on privacy on scurf this week we're doing dci there's a lot of posts on dci on scurf next week whatever you want to talk about find some research that's related to it share that research so we can all get engaged on the forum and in the discussions with it so hope to see you there Awesome. Thank you. And I'm excited between John and his involvement in Gridcoin and uh, uh, Sonke and Martin talking about blockchain for science. We'll have a few folks present on that call who can talk about what DSI was before DSI was getting slung around as an active term used by everyone. So yeah, I'm uh, excited to get into that. And the last plug will be around uh, the next reading group that we're going to do, which is going to be on the Infinite, Infinite Machine by Camila Russo. Uh, and we'll send out uh, something by early next week for people to kind of RSVP, and we'll get some initial dates planned out there. Um, but yeah, I believe those are all of the housekeeping matters. If I forgot any, please feel free to drop them in chat and we can bring them up at the end. Uh, and thank you, Daniel. I see you you, uh, you gave a shameless plug for when I was on your podcast. Uh, so that feels like a wonderful transition point to asking you and Yaakov to, to hop in and introduce yourselves. And uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about Active Inference Institute, which y'all are getting up to there. Sure. How about Yaakov? Feel free to say hi and introduce yourself, and then I'll kind of give an introduction. Cool. Yeah. So, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yakub. I'm currently an undergrad student studying maths and physics. Um, uh, I've been involved in the design space uh, for almost a year now. I started out doing token engineering for DSI and eventually uh, met Daniel and got involved in the active inference. Institute, well, previously Active Inference Lab, and uh, now have been working on the Active Block Friends package that we're gonna uh, talk about today. Excellent. So thank you all for having us at this discussion. It's great work and we've been following along with SCRF. And uh, it is a discussion, so please feel free to add any questions in the chat, or we'll probably have time to deal with the uh, raised hands towards the end. And just from those cool, short updates, entering into an area that may have some technical details arising, but entering in from just these really critical points that were addressed, like we talked about processes for community feedback. We heard about how to integrate technological developments with the social and the historical, like understanding the current relationship of decentralized science or DSI with open science and just frankly science overall. And then um, learning by doing and SCRF and other groups and organizations and DAOs and so on that are exploring new ways to facilitate global accessibility to research and also rigor and professionalism and approaching that nexus in somewhat of a new way. So I think we'll be around that strange attractor or attractor set a bunch today. First, I'll just describe uh, briefly the Active Inference Institute. And then for much of the discussion, we'll be talking about the project Active Blockference, which is a open source package. And we'll talk more about what it does soon. Um, so first, just to the Active Inference Institute. As mentioned, it begun as Active Inference Lab in 2021 with a mission around education and research in the area of Active Inference, which we'll come to in a second. And uh, over the past two months, to better encompass that dual mission of education and research, and also to reflect some like organizational restructuring we became Active Inference Institute. And uh, the link in the chat, you can see the org stream from about eight months ago or so with Eugene, where we threaded together a lot of discussions around like organization and also connected it to Active Inference wherever possible, as we do. Um, we're going to talk today mainly about Active Blockference, this project, and that's just to ground our discussion in the specifics because as with many other areas it can go quite out quite fast and the link to this project is shared in the chat we'll talk about the block friends what it is including its precursors or dependencies which can broadly be categorized as what is active inference and then what is cad cad or what is the framework that's actually implementing active inference in this setting 
Um, and then we'll talk about some possible applications of active block friends in a lot of areas that people might be interested in, ranging from like the social and community organizational to the DSI specifically, and the different facets of DSI, like peer review and funding or just coordination on knowledge management. Um, and again, please feel free to add any questions or thoughts in the chat. At its core, Active Block Friends is implementing active inference within a framework, CAD-CAD. CAD-CAD is a complex system simulation framework that's been used in a variety of tokenomic and cyber physical systems. And it provides a, a wealth of technical features that aren't part of like the module or the kernel of active inference. And we had a recent conversation actually on the CAD CAD community call where we talked about like the two way street between active inference and CAD CAD, like what they provide for each other and how they can work well together. So let's talk about what is active inference and then explore how to apply active inference in some social and technical settings. And much of this will be uh, continued to be built upon in a participatory way, scaffolded by our institute, and also will be the subject of a Gitcoin grant that will be in this upcoming early September GR15 round. OK, so. As for what is active inference, Jakob, please, or please give a first thought and then harvest, and then I'll continue. Yeah, so uh, active inference has been dubbed many uh, meta names. It has been called a framework, a, a theory, uh, a, a model. Uh, I'd say the simplest explanation is it's a way of describing uh, biological uh how biological entities uh interact in their environment and this takes um and the underlying framework uh built upon a lot of ideas from physics particularly the hamilton's principle of least action which in classical physics is used to describe how objects that are moving along some trajectory always follow the trajectory of least energy. And this same concept is now applied to autonomous systems where given some belief states, uh, entities will always follow a trajectory of least resistance. Uh, so it is a very intuitive, uh, intuitive notion. Some, uh, some might even say it's pretty tautological, but from this very simple concept, uh, we uh, the uh, the the work gets extended by a very wide mathematical formalism, and it's also possible and its generality also allows it to be integrated into other sub areas such uh, such as statistical physics or economics, and or even systems engineering and DSI. Great summary. Um, and I can't exactly see whose hands are raised, so maybe just use the chat. Um, and yes, to, to Eugene's question, indeed. Hopefully that's what we can do. So let me give another take. Thanks for sharing that, Jakob, very um, nicely said. Another way to talk about active inference is it provides a minimal model for what is an entity. And that is like separating out the figure from the ground or it's separating the thing from not that thing. Or it's like, if you've ever done agent-based modeling, it's the separation between the turtles in that logo, the little things that move around the space and the space itself. So that partitioning of the entity from the environment or just interfaces more generally are at the core of active inference. And so this entity model, the active inference entity is an input output model. So it maps very cleanly to a variety of systems, stock and flow diagrams or systems engineering diagrams. The input we associate with sense data. The output we associate with action and everything that happens after input, but before action, we can consider to be like cognition, which is something that we're not able to directly observe. We can't directly measure attention. Yes, you can do neuroimaging and so on, but in the general case, 
we don't need to directly observe what's happening inside of the cognitive entity. We may be able to still make models based upon what is coming in and what is going out. So it's a lot like an API. And just as we're crossing these different systems, that is the generality of active inference, is the ability to describe different things, which have a technical definition of a thing. It's a persistent entity. That helps us move across different systems and compose simulations and design systems that contain heterogeneous components, including like nested components. And the formalism is building on the Bayesian graphical approach, which is where a lot of the terms like Markov blanket or variational Bayesian inference come from. That graphical Bayesian approach has been around since around the 1980s, and especially in the last 10 to 20 years, building on that fundamental work of like Perl and others, that has become increasingly easy to apply with computational frameworks. And especially through a, a burst of philosophical interest and really um, diverse collaborations with many of the key players in the space on the technical side, active inference has also bridged into the 4E cognition area extended, embedded, ecological, and cultured, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the E's and all the other letters, everything that brings in that richness of the entity's engagement with the environment like Gestalt, the question is, can we approach that in a formal way? And to kind of plant one seed for what we'll come back to later, the kind of actions or the set of actions that an entity can take are called affordances. And that's drawing on the terms usage in ecological psychology, where we kind of like perceive and engage with the world in terms of action capacities. And that is a way to um, recognize this sort of intersubjective nature of action. Like what is a handle for one entity may not be a handle for another entity. So the functional description of this is a handle is often like, it's not a complete sentence. There has to be an entity and an engagement with a type of action in the niche. Um, and that's gonna come back when we talk about like, what are affordances on organizations? What can organizations do? What is interoception or introspection for an organization? What is attention for an organization? Or what about nested organizations or inter-organizational conversations and decision-making? Um, to give just another layer on how active inference has been applied especially most of the empirical modeling involving active inference has arisen in behavioral science especially human behavioral science which also a little funny note behavioral studies is called ethology ethology so it literally is the right area and most of those models of behavior have focused on single entity cognitive modeling with simple or with complex cognitive models, but focusing on behaviors like decision-making, um, ocular motor movement, like the role of attention and comprehension on vision tracking. And um, that single entity case, again, can be thought of as like a kernel for composing systems and simulations that involve multiple cognitive entities interacting for example, through a blockchain or through a discourse forum or through a discord chat or through a video chat. All of those can be thought of in a composable way in terms of what is the entity? What is their sensory perception? What is the cognitive update that occurs, including like belief updating and beliefs about actions that one will take, which is like planning as inference and then the inaction of that action and then the impact on the niche whether the niche is the impact on the blockchain and some double ledger gets changed, or the impact is the emoji is now recorded, or the impact is the speech behavior and the way that that's transmitted. Um, that's just the overview of active inference. And in this link shared here, you'll see many live streams with presentations and especially journal discussions that we've been involved in over the years because there's just more to say and more to learn. So it's certainly like a developing and a learning by doing area. Um, to close out this section as we move towards active block for 
and applications in some of the systems that people might be interested in. I'm going to post some more links and references. So this 2020 paper was the pre-active lab work that brought us together and begat active lab, which was us applying active inference to online team organization and basically the, the, the cyber physical niche for social relationships. Um, that work was furthered in a 2021 paper with RJ Corday and Scott David, where we talked about cooperation and conflict within the context of active inference and also connected it to some other um, operational discussions and the OODA loop, and some other areas. And then um, one work, not by our group, but a really excellent recent paper is this uh, epistemic communities under active inference. This is a paper that was modeling using active inference entities, Twitter communication behavior, or like a toy or a proxy model of Twitter conversation behavior and attention in a social setting. And this paper is really instructive in a variety of ways. First, it uses the open source package PyMDP, which is the kernel of what we're going to apply in active block fronts. PyMDP is implementing active inference entities. We've taken PyMDP and wrapped it within CAD CAD so that we can apply and design systems with the kind of expressivity and some of the other features like computational reproducibility and the specification of execution order that CAD CAD provides, and then integrate that with the generative models, which are described by PyMDP. Um, and then just one last uh, citation, and then Stephanie, thank you for the question, which Jakob, you can have a first answer on. This is in March of this year, where we were uh, assembling a really awesome team of collaborators from different DSI and Web3 communities, as well as more from like the research side. And in this paper, we explicitly wanted to tackle the question of DSI, like what is it? And rather than just enumerating the DAOs, which Nick, um, Link here, and others have done excellent work in categorizing that, we were able to flesh out these like two complementary or dancing aspects of DSI, one of which was very technological and um, implementation mechanism, financial and otherwise based, and saying DSI is about the um, introduction of novel mechanisms that didn't prior exist several years ago or so, and how those new mechanisms facilitate new kinds of DSI systems to emerge. And then we also had some collaborators who brought in a much deeper historical thread about the decentralization of sense making and the role of individual agency and their ability to like read and understand and then meaningfully implement and act on a scientific corpus. So pulling out some of those threads was very interesting and hopefully it comes across in the paper. And then also in that work, we introduced a structured ontology for DSI systems, AOS, Active Entity Ontology for Science. And we'll come back to that when we discuss block friends and some of the next steps for block friends. But first, um, Jakob, how do you situate this work in the larger team science or science of team science community? Stephanie's question. Yeah, I think I think that's a great question. Uh, with also many possible takes, I'm going to offer one from the from the view of modeling with uh, active block friends. And so, going back to the kind of generality we talked about uh, that uh, the active inference uh, formalism allows for, it's actually uh, it's possible to partition the the environment in many different at many different scales. So uh, the the partitioning of what constitutes an agent or what constitutes an environment is not necessarily limited to single to single entities or individuals, and it can be applied to entire teams as well. So we can have computational models of entire teams 
uh, acting in some in some environment, and I think mod modeling with with blockchain as the uh, underlying environment is a really exciting application that we'll get uh, get more into um, in a, in a couple of in a couple of minutes, uh, specific particularly because all of the data is available. So we can we can track both how individuals act in an in on the blockchain, how they interact with smart contracts, but also what the emergent uh, properties of the entire organizations are. And these and this kind of modeling can be informative both on in the design stage of an organization, like how do you want to structure uh, your your organization, but also but also during uh, during the organization's life cycle, uh, like does it does it actually fit with uh, with what the model is predicting, or are there some other uh, other insights that might be that might be gained from this from this kind of approach? And then there are also I think what's really exciting is also the combination of some of the affordances uh, of CAD CAD, which will also which I think we'll also get into once we give a, a brief overview of of cat cat but it's kind of this synergy of the cognitive modeling on the one on the one side and the kind of structural modeling on the other which i think fits perfectly in the context of of the science of team science i hope that uh at least partly answers the question nice to pick up on that last part about structural modeling, which is like a view from the top, top-down systems engineering. And then there's the view from the bottom, the inside out, the actual like embodied experience that participants will have in a system. And then to reflect on that distinction in light of the way that a lot of social systems design and tokenomics design has proceeded. So currently in CAD CAD, if one were studying say a staking contract, or a situation where there was some percentage for whatever that percentage was. One could use functionally macroeconomics and say, well, if we reduce the interest by 1%, then here's where the other curve intersects that, or here's from the top down or at the mean field approximation, here's what we expect. If you increase this, then this will go down. That is like the top down macroeconomic perspective. And it's not negated by, it's complementary to this micro behavioral perspective, which is not like, okay, if we make the water bottle two ounces bigger, then people will buy it more. This is like the person is in the moment in the situation and there's the two bottles in front of them and they're making a decision. And that's where the cognitive model needs to be specified. And then if we're considering multiple entities, that's also where the cognitive diversity comes into play. So instead of rather just, well, if we change this fixed parameter of the system from seven to five, how do different entities integrate that and change their actions? And what does the variance across entities look like? And we're going to come back to that with the um, block fronts application. But I just want to add one more um, less computational, a little bit more just like research to follow in the team science thread. Um, the first is a paper from Dimitris Bolas and others through others we become ourselves. And the second is a very influential paper called Thinking Through Other Minds or TTOM, which is theory of mind, the ability to understand or at least emulate or be able to uh, have a grip on what one's like conversational partner, for example, is thinking we're not cloning their minds but it is that kind of a um that's social interaction without overthinking that component but it gets overthought in these papers so it's great um there's a few ways to go if anyone has any questions please um add them in otherwise i would like to um turn to eos and the ontology for dci and introduce just um, how EOS is laid out, and then talk about how we're going to um, operationalize EOS and the kinds of benefits it can bring to different epistemic ecosystems. Um, so the overall 
uh, AOS link has been placed in the chat, and I hopefully can share. Thank you. I can share. So um, here is the landing page for AOS. And there's some information like linking back to the paper for people who want to read it. Um, but to just walk through two parts of AOS. So the first are entity types. So we have two types of entities in AOS. There's informational entities and active entities. And um, informational entities are all kinds of information objects, informational resources, including executable ones, but also artifacts and emojis and comments. There's no need for it to be of a specific type. But these are informational objects. We can think of them like modifications in the digital niche. So our actions modify the digital niche, but we are not simply modificants in the digital niche. In contrast, we have active entities. And active entities range from the human. And then it also includes active entities that are nested within each other or completely different types of entities. Like here we have teams, DAOs, organizations, academic universities, research agencies, different kinds of groups, journals and publishers. And we'll talk about why there's um, this many. So importantly, we can just add new rows. And this is kind of like the dictionary of entities so that if somebody were to say, I would like to imagine a situation where a team of three humans sends a data set to a scientific audit group and they send a non-fungible asset back, the vision of our work is to imagine a triple play between that natural language description of systems visualizations of those systems and then a seamless simulation as Jakob described for real-time um, analysis and decision making and also prospectively for design like imagining counterfactuals on these kinds of composed systems um, and each of these entities has several attributes to it there's the affordances like what the entity can do those are the capacities for actions. So what can the funding agency do? They can provide funding to, they can communicate to, they can provide constraints to, they can provide opportunities to. Um, and then, the, again, these are like the dictionary or kind of like the taxonomy of different kinds of entities. And then within areas of concern, we have things like funding, communication, scientific review, research, publishing, and so on. And so here, we can talk about what roles are required or necessary or sufficient for a given area of concern to be realized. Like, takes two to tango? Okay, well, funding requires the funding requester and the funding provider. Other roles might come into play. And then, um, this is in Coda, which we've also seen some in your community use. It's a great um, platform for this type of knowledge engineering. Oh, what's an academic university? Ah, okay. It's an organization, an academic system, et cetera. And so having mouse over and the cross-linking is a really uh, effective feature. And also, again, speaks to that triple play, natural language, renderable visualizations, and then the digital twin type simulations, such that rather than sharing merely a table here, we could be sharing an ongoing simulation and then somebody with any computational background or any perspective on a system could say, well, what would happen if this were different about the system? And so that brings us even back to the earliest point about integrating and evaluating community feedback. How will that happen? Will that proceed through Baroque mechanisms and mailboxes and ad hoc governance decisions? Or will we have integrated generative models for organizations and their niche, such that different input and questions can be evaluated. And then there can be a common artifact where we can have a participatory discussion around different system parameters, like why something is a certain way and not a different way. And um, just to kind of conclude with the areas of concern, 
these areas of concern are addressing like facets of this large science system. It could apply elsewhere outside of science, but that's what we focused on here. It's kind of like a petal in the crypto economic flower for those who are in the um, token engineering communities. And each one of these may then be um, implemented through a variety of mechanisms, which the DeSci space is rapidly becoming populated with. And then importantly, by focusing on the area of concern as something functional that different entities engage in, that allows the ability to model systems that aren't like purely on the blockchain. So a funding provider could be from a legacy type institution or it could be from an individual. So by focusing on roles and what the roles engage in, in terms of actions, we can then model both CSI, centralized science, just to contrast it with DSI, and then take these anecdotal or even empirically driven cases that people describe as being limiting or um, resulting in tragedies of the commons, for example, like the attention crisis and peer review, being able to model that and then do that kind of counterfactual design such that that given area of concern can have system attributes that are in a preferable condition. And rather than that only being seen from the top down, well, maybe if we paid the reviewers more, well, then maybe what? Maybe it introduces some unintended consequences or who knows. So the aim of AOS overall is to focus on some functional aspects of science to break them down in terms of the roles that fulfill that function and the kinds of entities who can fulfill that role, which prepares us to automate or to um, have inter-organizational flexibility in research. And then being able to frame traditional or legacy or um, also future versions of how that area of concern is enacted in science. That is AOS and is um, hopefully worthwhile to go over um, the next stage, which we'll pause first for anyone to ask a question, write, written or um, verbally, is the next stage of our work is to implement AOS in the active block fronts package such that somebody could mention there's three people who prefer having more money. They also prefer having publications. There's a research agency that actually prefers to give its money away, but they want it to be done in this specific way. And then there's the research consumer and all of these types of relationships. We could then have formal models. But again, the triple play is to have something that's visual and verbal and translatable while also having that be seamless with the formal modeling so that there isn't like um, a gap where miscommunication or worse could come into play. So anyone feel free to raise your hand or Jakob, you can add any more there. Yes, Jonathan, please. Is this working? Hello, yes. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about um, how much modeling is going to play into what you're describing. Because I, I know that in economics, for example, it's the uh, study of human behavior with resources attached to it. And the modeling doesn't always work well. Uh, in fact, it's often wrong. And if we maybe, if, if we try to bring that modeling into a system of science, which really defines the technology that runs our lives, I'm wondering if that poses any threat to the actual outcomes of science. Yes, very important question. There's a few ways to go. Um, we can be on the open source path of participatory communities and how they model and sense make in science and design systems, evaluate extant systems and how they enact decisions about future systems. Or we can let those processes occur in the shadows, ultimately. So I believe being on the modeling path without treating the model or any model as if it were like the artifact or the entire um, like oracle of action is a, a valuable approach. 
and definitely not overfitting. And so understanding how to have qualified use of models and responsive models is very important. Um, and these are the kinds of anecdotal or intuition-based systems changes that people are talking about. I mean, why, are, why would we talk about sending a fungible asset to a reviewer? Or why would we talk about having DAOs structured this or that way? That is the boutique or the farmer's market phase, as I like to think about DSI engineering, which isn't even to say it's not delicious and healthy. It's just that that can be complemented with formal models. And then, of course, those formal models would not be serving their function if they destroy the farmer's market. So I think it will be possible to use these frameworks even without running a script. I think these tables and this um, ontological distinction of different areas of concern and different entities, um, that can bring clarity to a group's decision making even without simulation. Um, is there a chance where CAD CAD can function without active inference? Yes. 99.99% of CAD CAD to this day is without active inference. We're injecting this side stream or building the bridge there, but all of CAD CAD is non active inference outside of our project. And that includes um, like an ETH2 economic validator model and like a huge amount of very complex systems modelings. So yes, you'll find like an enormous amount of education and resource related to CADCAD. So there's CADCAD.org and then also specifically um, CADCAD.education. So that could be of interest to some um, systems engineers and token researchers. Um, Fotis? Yeah. Um, I, I want to say that as somebody who's studied cognitive science and has been uh, into this newer uh more dynamically embodied approaches i really appreciate i, I this is something that uh, should be in the world <laughs> i'm really glad that it exists um especially in this um very chaotic space where things need to make sense um uh what i but, but i um assume that a lot of people here don't have uh, the background that I do, like I uh, um, understand active inference, but it is something very, it's a framework that is very, very uh, occult in some sense. Um, and so uh, I wonder if there's some plans on more pop sci, uh, science popularization uh, strategies to get active inference out so that people can be on the same page more because uh, to, to be honest, this is a very formalized model. Uh, there's a lot of background in for recognition that I, I assume people are not familiar with here. So um, um, th th there's a big educational uh, gap and a big educational aspect that is missing right now. So I'm wondering what uh, do you have in mind in terms of that? Thank you, Fotis. Indeed, the education, research, communication, inclusion, participation gap is large in active inference and in other scientific areas. And that is the mission of Active Inference Institute. So it's what we're up to. And of course, everybody is welcome to get involved. On the popularization front, I'll point towards this um, recent article by uh, several authors in a short form. And also, one could look back to the live streams and the textbook groups and the educational materials that we're developing. So it is indeed an um, important area to focus on the education. And that includes like translation into different human languages with and without math. I think the um, not even light at the end of the tunnel, the light in like the beginning of the tunnel is that 4E or however people want to think about it may be tangible and just able to get a working grasp very quickly. For example, the embodied experiences about having a finger on a surface, you can't tell what the texture is without moving it. There's action and inference or our blind spot. We don't perceive it. Oh, generative model of vision. There's, or what about the eye cicading? Why don't those cause us nausea? Because we attenuate our precision to the generative model while we're cicading. And so there's like so many embodied on ramps into this and 
two plus two, someone could say it's simple or somebody could spend their whole life going into the number theory. So there will be a technical, in fact, many disparate technical aspects, I think, to this work. And everybody can be doing it together in the spirit of like commons and public goods and the knowledge ecosystem. And I hope that that combination of the tangibility of embodied cognition and its qualitative and experiential basis will help ease um, onboarding and increase accessibility of the material. And then just like everything else, people don't decline to um, take undergraduate chemistry or to use salt because they don't have every chemistry PhD. So it's kind of a meta point that people will have to be in a mode of learning by doing, being comfortable with uncertainty and having that kind of uh, approach when working together. But those are also some of the virtues of teamwork. So it could be a great match. Um, Harvest. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, this works for SIDS. Um, Sorry, can you speak a little bit closer? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I I said um, some of what what was said went over my head. Uh, I I just discovered this eye. I think last month, and it's it's a very novel concept to me. But um, it's it's been an informative uh, call. So, but I do have a, a couple of questions. Um, so, I'd I'd like to know how can DAOs benefit from what um, active influence is doing at the moment, and how how can I want to get involved too? Yeah. Thank you for the question. How can DAOs benefit Jakob with a lot of experience in token engineering? What would you say about that? Yeah, I'd say um, from, from the token engineering standpoint, uh, it's this combination of the kind of bottom up and top down modeling. So uh, the majority of, or can't really speak about the majority, but most of the CAD CAD models that uh, I come across uh, follow this kind of structural approach to DAO modeling, where you really want to figure out what your parameter space is, and then you um, want to sweep over that space to find all the possible trajectories and all the possible outcomes uh, within within your system. Uh, now that can give you a lot of insights about the actual properties of that system, but in term but on but it doesn't really tell you uh, how the system is actually going to work. Uh, and that's something that active inference can help with, where given, um, given some set of beliefs, the agents are going to uh, act within that system. And you can, and you, you can model, model that to try to figure out how that system will actually evolve. And I think that also this also links to another question that's been asked in the chat, whether these models get compared to collected data. Uh, so in, in behavioral science, um, there's been a lot of work done on uh, inferring the prior belief states of the agents given the existing behavioral da data. So uh, you have existing data, and then you're trying to figure out, well, what beliefs do, does the agent need to have to act to uh, so that its actions are going to be base optimal. And the same thing, uh, now these uh, studies, I think we're uh, doing this on data from, uh, from mice and rats in pretty simple examples. So applying this to the blockchain and to these very large scale state spaces is going to be challenging, but I think that's a very clear uh, application that could provide a lot of value. Thanks, Jakob. Harvest, you had a further question? Yeah, I, I, was, I was asking, how can I get involved with 
active in France. I, I I think it was you that said something about um, working or dealing with uncertain things and all. So yeah, I feel like that would be a good opportunity to do so. Awesome, really appreciate that. Um, I posted the link to our Discord. And for this project specifically, we meet Wednesdays at 12 and 17 UTC. And they're in the Discord voice channel. People can drop in and we can see what people, what, which ways people want to go on a given day and what is there to do. And that's a project that could certainly benefit from those with no to high levels of expertise in Python, Julia, CAD CAD, active inference, writing technical documentation, writing accessible how to guides. There are many, many affordances in this project, and we're always looking to improve the structuring of it. Um, in our last several minutes, anyone else can ask um, a thought, or maybe um, I'll, I'll first just mention the. Um, so please write down anything, but I'll mention the basis of our upcoming Gitcoin grant and direction. And that is related to cognitive auditing for smart contracts and for smart contract ecosystems. So the state of the art in smart contract auditing is what could be done in a um, static or dynamic computational testing environment. You know, can this contract be rugged because this function is called by this actor or oh if they enter just zero in the data then this happens so those are the kinds of like computational um problems that smart contract auditing is able to detect we want to complement that by no means replace it with cognitive auditing which is understanding how a smart contract as deployed in a niche a blockchain will interact with cognitive entities who have different preferences, affordances, expectations, sensitivities, attention dynamics, regimes of attention. Those entities interacting with a smart contract might induce volatility or unexpected consequences that one could never determine merely by looking at which variables were protected or not. One could consider that emergent properties or just realized properties of the smart contract. For example, maybe the um, parameter that adjusts the um, token price of a swap is computationally sound. However, in the context of people making real buys and sells, it's destabilizing in the eyes of people who are utilizing it. And so we're very interested to explore how with a test net or some other approach, we could have smart contract as an entity type, human as an entity type, and all these kinds of processes could be understood in terms of their embodied, even if digital, but realized consequences of actors taking actions, rather than again, this like either macro top down, which is half the picture because we need to meet it with the bottom up, and then the computational auditing and security perspective on smart contracts and computational systems is also half the picture. But where it meets cognitive security is with this notion of a cognitive audit. So um, Harvest and then Jonathan. I'll jump in while we wait for yep. Harvest. Um, yes. So just so I understand clearly, it sounds like you you want to test the game theory of some of these protocols in a closed environment. Yes, the game theory could be designed from a macroeconomic perspective. We made the matrix for the prisoner's dilemma like such and such, so why is everybody doing that? And right, that? right, that sounds really cool. So it would be like um, being able to see how the behavior of Polkadot's reward system might incentivize people to do, you know, to, to put 100% uh, claims on any rewards that uh, a validator gets, that sort of thing. And, and seeing like, that sounds really neat. I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, and the extensibility and the flexibility of these models and the, the composition that can occur in CAD CAD, we could ask, okay, well, the entity is only paying attention to the market price. Okay, now the entity is plugged into Twitter, like the Twitter model that was shared earlier. Or now different entities are plugged into different information resources and they have different cognitive attributes or different regimes of attention and they're making different decisions. 
that is abstracted or just like collapsed into a point with the macroeconomic view. Oh, well, if the 30 year bond curve is 2%, then, then what? People are in different situations. So I know- we um, want to complement the top down with this bottom up simulation. Yeah, I'm, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I might have to jump on the Discord. But um, I'm curious how you're going to do that. Like, how are you going to simulate users' experiences and and them doing X, Y, and Z based on what the protocol is telling them to do? Yes, we'll close with addressing this again. First off, thanks so much for all of the excellent SCRF work and for inviting us. Everyone's welcome to join our Discord, join this project, join learning groups and other projects happening. How will it happen? Um, to coarse grain it, specify the entity types that are involved, like we showed with EOS. Create an active block for instance, entity model in Python or Julia for that entity type. Compose simulation environments such that the entities are interacting with the same environment. And then do parameter sweeps in CAD CAD across system parameters and cognitive parameters. Step five, you know, line of question marks. Step six, <laughs> epistemic commons that work for everybody. That sounds great. Thank you, guys. Thank you, SCRF. See you in our discords. Thanks Goodbye. for coming, Daniel. Thank and you, Appreciate it. Have a good Thursday, everyone.